what's happening everyone? In our last video in this series we covered the most simple of all sorting algorithms, the bubble sort. And in this video I'll be taking a look at another simple, yet inefficient sorting algorithm, the selection sort. In the beginning of this lesson we'll cover the basics and methodology of the algorithm, and later we'll open up a coding editor and actually implement the selection sort using the Python coding language. At the end we'll perform some benchmarks to compare our selection sort algorithm to both the built-in Python sort method as well as the bubble sort we've created in the last lesson. As always, if you enjoy the video or find it interesting or informative, consider throwing me a thumbs up. Also, take some time to check out the rest of the content on my channel, and if it fits your taste, think about subscribing so you can be notified when I upload new coding videos. So to start off, similar to our last video, I'll begin by analyzing an animation of the sorting algorithm in action to help synthesize some of the high-level features. As we can see in the GIF on the right, we start with a completely unsorted list of elements. In each iteration, the sorting algorithm sifts through the remaining portion of unsorted items and appends the smallest item found onto the end of the sorted section. As the algorithm progresses, the sorted section grows and the unsorted section becomes relatively smaller. The end of the sorting is guaranteed once the length of our sorted section is equal to the length of the original input array. Another thing to notice is that similar to bubble sort, we'll be having to iterate over the same group of numbers and perform the same comparisons many times before we reach our final sorted output, the main factor which leads to the inefficiency of the algorithm. On the other hand, we can see that all the operations take place in only a single array, meaning our memory requirements are fairly small. On the next slide, we'll go through the pseudocode for the selection sort, so you can relate these high-level ideas to their lower-level implementation. So we can see here, we're declaring a function named selection sort that's passed a single list object A. At the beginning of the function, we haven't yet sorted any elements, so we set our sorted length variable equal to zero. We then enter into a while loop that will continue iterating until the sorted length variable is equal to the length of the input array A, at which point we know we're done sorting. Inside the while loop, on each iteration we first set a minimum index variable equal to negative 1, signifying that we have not yet found the index of the minimum value. We'll talk more about this variable in a second. After that, we enter into a for loop, which iterates a variable i, starting at the length we have currently sorted, until the end of the input array a. On each iteration, we check to see if the element at index i in the array is the smallest item we've come across so far. If so, we set our minimum index variable equal to the current index i. At the completion of the for loop, we perform a single swap, swapping the smallest value we found in the for loop with the prior value at the end of the sorted section. We then increment the sorted length variable to signify that we've sorted another element and repeat the process until all the elements are sorted. Because we must iterate over the array as many times as there are items, and on each iteration we must perform comparisons on up to all the elements, we see an exponential time complexity when operating the selection sort, under all circumstances. Even if we passed a pre-sorted array into selection sort, it would still take big O of n squared because we would still have to go through all the same procedures as we would with an unsorted array. Selection sort doesn't require any external data structures or arrays, and all swaps are performed in place, making its space complexity only big O of 1. For these reasons, selection sort is normally not recommended unless the application has very stringent memory requirements, which is not a very common scenario these days. I'll now move over to a coding editor and implement selection sort using Python. So now that we have our coding editor open, the first thing we're going to do is re-implement the same create array function we used in our prior video. This method will create a new list with length equal to the size parameter, where each element is a randomly selected integer in the range from 0 up to the value of the max parameter. We'll use the arrays created with this function to test the accuracy of our selection sort. We'll now switch over to terminal and print out one of the randomized arrays to ensure the function is working properly. As you can see, we were able to successfully create a randomized array of length 10, so our create array method is working great. We'll now write some code to create a randomized array and print it to the terminal. We'll then sort it using our selection sort function, we'll be implementing in a second, and print it out again so we can see that it was, in fact, sorted. We now have all the helper code necessary for us to begin writing the actual selection sort function. The function will essentially be a direct Python analog of the pseudocode we covered earlier. The function will be passed a single parameter, our unsorted array variable, a. Inside the function, we'll first be creating a variable called sort length, representing the length of the sorted portion of the array. Since we haven't performed any swaps yet, this value will be set to zero. We'll then enter into a while loop and continue iterating until the length of our sorted portion is equal to the length of the entire array. On each iteration of the while loop, we'll create a variable called minimum index to hold the index at the smallest value we found in the unsorted portion. In the for loop, we'll be using the built-in Python enumerate function to iterate over the elements of the array while also getting the current iteration index. Iteration will start at the length of the current sorted portion and continue until the end of the array, meaning we'll be iterating over the unsorted portion. On each iteration of the for loop, we'll be checking to see if the value in the array at the current index is the smallest we've seen. If so, we set the current minimum index equal to the current index plus the length of the sorted portion, meaning the index in the overall array, A. After each for loop completion, we'll swap the values found at the element after the sorted portion 
and the recently found smallest item of the unsorted portion, effectively increasing the length of the sorted portion by one. We then increment the sorted length variable to represent this change. At the end of the while loop, once our entire array is sorted, we'll return the updated array variable. Let's switch over to terminal and test our selection sort on a randomized array. As we can see, we've successfully sorted the input array, meaning our selection sort is working properly. We'll now move back to a coding editor so we can benchmark the function against the built-in sorting method and our bubble sort algorithm from the prior video. First thing we're doing here is just transferring over our bubble sort method. Check out the prior video if you don't already know how the bubble sort function operates. We'll be benchmarking the three sorting techniques with randomized arrays of length 10, 100, 1000, and 10,000. For each length, we'll first create the array using our createArray method, then sort using the three functions, timing each individually. At the end, we'll print out the results to the terminal in a table format for easy comparison. We'll now switch to terminal and run the script so we can compare the results. As we can see, once again, the built-in Python sorting method is by far the most efficient from a time complexity standpoint. Between our selection of bubble sort methods, we can see that the time to complete the bubble sort increases faster, meaning our selection sort would be the preferred method for large input array sizes. That takes us to the end of this video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it, or at least now have the ability to implement the selection sort method with relative ease. Stay tuned for my upcoming videos covering merge sort and quick sort, both of which should outperform bubble and selection sort. I'll see you guys in the next one.